All right, if you have your Bible, open it up, please, to Isaiah chapter 29. Thank you for being here tonight. We have about 45 minutes together, and we are continuing in our Bible class of the book of Isaiah. So just a couple of reminders. Number one, we are going to go through Isaiah to the end of the year. And there are 66 chapters in the book, and so we are slowly but surely making our way. There's so much information in each one of these chapters and I've been really thinking about how do we, you know, how does this become even more relevant for us as we read these verses and these chapters? So looking at some of the information and what we read this week, this is a continuation from last week. Uh, there's just some really thought-provoking passages that we read about. So if you have your Bible, we're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 29. We're going to be on lesson number nine, and we finished up the previous lesson, and we got into chapter 28 and also into chapter 29. So I want to begin in chapter 29. We'll read a little bit here to kind of set the tone again for those who may be new to the class. So let's first begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we recognize even more through our study tonight that you are holy and that you are always good and just and fair. We are so thankful, Father, that you are compassionate toward your people. Truly, you're compassionate toward everyone in the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross. We're thankful, Father, that the brighter days that are talked about from Isaiah or by Isaiah and the great blessings that we are able to enjoy because of your son and what he has done for us on the cross. So as we go through our lives, our, our days, our weeks, our months, help us, Father, to fall back more on, on you and your strength and your character and your nature. Help us to, to look in the mirror even more and to learn from what has been written as you so desperately desire for us to do. To seek you, to, to search after you, to continue to trust in you at all times. Be with those who are sick and help us, Father, to truly live like we are dying and to understand that the best is yet to come, that our minds are focused on heaven, that we're laying up treasures in heaven that cannot be destroyed by rust or moth or storms or anything else. Thank you, Father, for this time that we have together as a family. We're so blessed here at West Main, people who love one another, who strive to have one heart, one soul. Be with us in Jesus' name, amen. So these chapters here really are, are good, and you guys may need to adjust the volume. I'll, I'll just let you guys take the lead with that. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 29. I think this really sets the tone, and let's read a little bit, and then we will uh, dive into some thoughts. Verse number 1, Woe, O Ariel, Ariel, the city where David once camped. Add year to year, observe your feast on schedule. I will bring distress to Ariel, and she will be a city of lamenting and mourning, and she will be like an Ariel to me. I will camp against you and circling you, and I will set siege works against you. And I will raise up battle towers against you, then you will be brought low. From the earth you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, your words will come. Your voice will also be like that of a spirit from the ground, and your speech will whisper from the dust. But the multitude of your enemies will become like fine dust, and the multitude of the ruthless ones like the chaff which blows away. And it will happen instantly, suddenly. From the Lord of hosts you will be punished with thunder and earthquake and loud noise, with whirlwind and tempest and the flame of a consuming fire, and the multitude of all the nations who wage war against Ariel. Even all who wage war against her and her stronghold and who distress her will be like a dream, a vision of the night. It will be as when a hungry man dreams and behold, he is eating. But when he awakens, his hunger is not satisfied or as when a thirsty man dreams and behold, he is drinking. But when he awakens, behold, he is faint and his thirst is not quenched. Thus, the multitude of all the nations will be who wage war against Mount Zion. Be delayed and wait, blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. 
For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets, and he has covered your heads, the seers. The entire vision will be to you like the words of a sealed book, which when they give it to the one who is literate, saying, please read this, he will say, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this, and he will say, I cannot read. Then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me, Consist of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. There are so many different chapters, obviously. There are 66 chapters here, and I think for so many of these chapters, they really give us a nice summary of what Isaiah was dealing with, with his audience, what the book is really all about. And just listening to me read, and as you read along with it, what are some of the big pillars that stood out to you that I think really encompassed the book? Did you pick up on some of those? The message, there's a lot of repetition in this book that Isaiah is going to remind the people of. And what stood out to you where, imagine maybe there's someone new to the class tonight, and they're reading chapter 29, they're like, what, what's going on here? There's a couple big points that really are, are being emphasized throughout what we've already read. What were some of those points that, that stood out to you? So one big point that is emphasized throughout this book is for the people of God, their, their worship and how from the outside looking in, everything seems to be in alignment. They have all the boxes checked. They seem to be doing the right things, but obviously God sees the heart. And so what Tim mentioned in verse 13, it, it wasn't from the heart. It was lip service. And that's the theme that we find throughout the book going back to chapter 1. And when he speaks about Ariel in verse number one, that's, that's talking about uh, the, the city of Jerusalem, the Israelites. And so this is a message being directed to God's people, a passage that Jesus is going to quote in Matthew 15 and also Mark chapter 7. So we've talked about these woes, and that's a big pillar of this book, if you're reading Isaiah maybe for the first time. The prophet is going to the people, God's people. And remember back in Isaiah chapter 6, what did God tell Isaiah the response was going to be, more often or not, from his people? What was that response going to be? When he gave them this message, they would do what? The majority of them are not going to listen, right? There's going to be some, right? There's going to be a remnant, but the majority of them are not going to listen. What's another big pillar that we see in these verses here from Isaiah chapter 29. Any thoughts? So, two words really maybe to sum up what you just said, God says. God is the one that's going to lead or allow these other nations to, de to destroy his nation, to punish them essentially, right? And that's exactly what we see in verse number five, but the multitude of your enemies. So, four times in verse five, he, he uses the word multitude twice. In verse 7, he says the multitude. And then in verse 8, the last part, he speaks about the multitude. So, again, the enemies of, of God's people, Assyria in particular, God is going to use them, as, as Stephen just said, to bring about this punishment. Yet they're not going to be left to their own devices either because God says, well, Assyria, you're going to go down as well. And so that's one of the big themes of this book as well. That's what we've seen. We, we, we see the control of God. 
we see the, the, how God is able to, uh, what is it, Proverbs 21, um, you know, the hand of the nations, or he moves them however he wills. And we see that clearly. We also see a terrible picture, because in verse number 4, he said, Then you will be brought low, from the earth you will speak, and from the dust where you are prostrate, your words will come. Your voice will, will be like that of a spirit from the ground. It's the idea that they're going to have very little strength, and your speech will whisper from the, from the dust. And so it's like the idea that they're going to be gasping for breath. And one commentary spoke about how mediums were said to speak in a low voice. So maybe there's some connection there with, you know, you put your trust in these kinds of people, and, and this is what's going to happen. And it's just interesting here just to see how, how low they're going to be brought, and yet we see this contrast in verse number 5. And so beginning in verse number 5, going through verse number 8, we see judgment that's going to come upon Assyria. And you can say it's not just for Assyria, but also other world powers. We're going to see that eventually this would happen to uh, Assyria, to Babylon, and the list would go on and on. And so as you read Isaiah, think about, again, the, the control of God, the the fact that indeed he rules over all the nations, and that's what we've seen quite a bit in chapters 13 through 23, and even now. So judgment's going to come upon even the enemies of God's people. And so let's look now in verses 9 through 13. And 9 through 13, what message is being delivered here to the people? And we're not going to necessarily go through each question. We're, we're going to catch up a little bit, but... Um, you know, the more I read this, the, the more impactful it is as you go through the chapter because it's just so vivid. And what message is being relayed in verses 9 through 13? If you remember back to chapter 28, there was something that was taking place with the leaders. The leaders were often drunk, yeah. And you see, like, this physical drunkenness that appears in chapter 28. I mean, these were, this was the action that they were involved in. Now in chapter 29, it appears maybe Isaiah is really trying to emphasize more the spiritual drunkenness. And if that's the case, then what's this idea that he's trying to get across in verse 9? They become drunk but not with wine. They stagger but not with strong drink. What's that idea there? Any thoughts? Yeah, pride. What's the impression that, that God's people have toward his prophet or prophets? Yeah, they're mocking them. They are not impressed at all. It doesn't really matter what they say. They're not impressed at all. And, and essentially, what is God going to allow them to do? The people. What's he going to allow them to do? I see you nodding your head. What, what, what's he going to allow his people to do? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. He's going to allow them to go down this path. He's going to allow them to pursue what, what it is that they're going to pursue. Um, and it, it, it just seems like, you know, you just stay in this condition right here. He's going to allow that to happen. And it sounds like, I think we talked about this last class, Romans 1 and verse 28, where, you know, he, he gives people over and he allows them to go down this path. And, and so this idea of being in this deep sleep or this spirit of deep sleep, I think it's just this idea he's going to give them up. They're, they're on this path of error. He's given them this opportunity to, to repent, and yet, and yet they don't do that. And so the, the imagery that we see in verse number 11 and verse number 12, I think, really sums it all up, which what he's going to get into in verse number 14, or verse number 13, that, you know, the words of the prophets are essentially sealed up, and it's going to be like you know, a book that is sealed. Uh, when, when those scrolls were rolled up, obviously you couldn't read it. And for a person who can't read, you know, they're not going to get anything out of this. And we see the, the reason as to why. In verse 13, the Lord said, Because these people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. So if you were thinking about this for today's, for us today, and I think that was one of the questions, how do we avoid this?
Or if you make it more personal, how do you avoid it? Go ahead. It's got to be more than just on the surface. It, it truly has to be a relationship. What else? Any other thoughts? Go ahead, brother. Yeah, there, there's got to be examination for sure. And for people who were so close to uh, the word of God with the prophets, and we saw that back in chapter 28, and we won't go into that more, but in verse 14 he says, Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelous with, marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous. Is that a good marvelous or a bad marvelous? <laughs> the fact that I'm laughing, it's bad, right? So... He's, he's saying, this is what I'm going to do. The, the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Woe to those who deeply hide their plans from the Lord, and whose deeds are done in dark place, in a dark place. And they say, who sees us, or who knows us? What plans is he talking about? And if you read ahead, the, the, proceed, the, the chapters coming up essentially lay it out. What plans is he talking about there? I thought I heard somebody. Any, anyone? What plans were the Israelites doing? What are they doing? I think, I think he's pointing to this alliance that they're going to try to make with Egypt, uh, putting their trust in God or putting their trust in Egypt. And this is another great thought to ponder and to meditate upon. Who sees us? Who knows us? Uh, our Father in heaven knows it knows our hearts. He said in verse 16, You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? That what is made would say to its maker, He did not make me? Or what is formed say to him who formed it, He has no understanding? So the audacity of God's people to say, Well, He doesn't really know. He, you know, we, we know what's better. There is that lack of respect. There is that lack of fear that you talked about, right, from Proverbs chapter 1. And so these first 16 verses here are really driving home, I think, the, the, the problem with, with the people of God. There was a, a lack of respect and uh, a lack of fear, uh, just a total disregard um, from God. And yet there's still going to be better days, that God is going to provide something for them. Um, and, uh, and ultimately that's going to come through the Messiah one day. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And I don't think you can help but to think about where we live because we're talking about nations and we see God interacting with nations. He still is in the affairs of men. And so, you know, there's uh, in one commentary as we, we move on, we see in chapter 30, and that's, just, that's a great segue, maybe even getting into chapter 30. Um, and there's a lot more we could talk about in verses 17 through 24. Uh, which seem to be pointing to what the Messiah is going to bring about. But the alliance or the reliance upon these other nations and how God is just essentially laughing at them. And, the, you know, the interesting thing, too, he is talking to his people. 
And that's a, that's a pretty scary thought. He's talking to his people. And while there are judgments against other nations, this message is going to, to his people. And so I think there's great application for us even in America where, you know, it's, it, it, really turn, it really comes down to trust. And, you know, are we trying to make alliances or are we trying to really rely upon God? And I'm not talking necessarily about the country per se, but us who live here as Christians, where it is something good for us. And I think as you get into chapter 30, look at verse number one. He says, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, who make an alliance. So there's an idea of an alliance, but not of my spirit in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me. Uh, My mind thinks about King David, how he would often consult with God about whether or not he should go into battle. And if God said yes, then he would. If God said no, then he would not. And this part of the chapter here really lays out, if you have your workbook, I'm not going to worry about the slides tonight. If you have your workbook, it's question number nine, in what way were the people rebellious? And let me just read this. And you guys list, you guys give it back to me after we get done. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine. So I've already said that. And make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame, and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt your humiliation. For their princes are at Zoan, and their ambassadors arrive at Hanes. Everyone will be ashamed because of the people who cannot profit them, who are not for help or profit but for shame and also reproach, for reproach. So just in those verses there, what rebellion do you see uh, outside of verse number one? What else do you see that the people are doing? Go ahead. Yeah, it turns into a lesson of trust. And the, the, the foolish thing about it and is that it, none of it's going to work. None of it's going to work. And, you know, uh, can this be applied to us today? Absolutely. You know, we can only, you know, you can put a lot of trust in your health, in your jobs, in your financial status. Uh, so many different things, things that protect us, right? And even just being in a country that is wealthy. Um, it's interesting how things change, though. We go back to, like, our default mode where... Last week was 9-11. Did you take time to think about 9-11? You know, 9-11 changed everything for America, where it showed us, wow, this could happen to us. And churches were packed for months after 9-11. It was that wake-up call, but it's been, what, 19 years. And, and so we can even get comfortable with that and and, you know, things are back to quote-unquote normal. And um, so we see this rebellion with the, with the Israelites here. And here's the sad thing. It gets actually really, it's even worse. Because in verse 6, he says, The oracle concerning the beast of the Negev, through a land of distress and anguish, from where comes, for where come lioness and lion, viper and flying serpent? They carry their riches on the backs of young, young donkeys and their treasures on camels' humps. To a people who cannot profit them. So God is just looking at all of this and thinking, <laughs> this is never going to work. Uh, you can't put your trust in this nation. Had the prophet already spoken about Egypt? You guys remember what he said about Egypt? Remember in those chapters 13 through 23? He spoke about punishment that would come towards Egypt. There, there could be no reliance upon Egypt. He said in verse 7, Even Egypt, whose hope is vain and empty, Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who has been exterminated. Uh, Rahab, or arrogance, uh, who had been exterminated. So he uses this kind of language like in chapter 29 with Ariel, as he talked about Jerusalem. This, this language here to denote some point that's trying to be made of the, the mindset or the attitude of the people. And he, he used that language here, talk, describing Egypt as Rahab. He said, now go write on a tablet before them and inscribe it on a scroll that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. That maybe harkens back to Isaiah chapter 8 where he was told to write something as well. 
For this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord. Is there not great application for us there? How stubborn will we be? You know, you don't have to learn to follow God or to listen to God or to trust in God by hitting rock bottom. We don't have to hit rock bottom to say, oh, yeah, I need to listen to him. But that's essentially what they're going to do. They're going to hit rock bottom. And it's going to take that for them to, to trust again in God and to take away those, those idols. So I want you to notice the, the mindset again in verse number 9. He says, for this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, you must not see visions. And so it's this, again, this mindset that they have. And to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. So how do the people even reach this point where they have no interest at all in God's word? It's, it's, it's superficial. And that goes back to the yeah, they're honoring me with their lips. But, but truly, I see where they're at. They really don't want to hear this at all. Can you think of other examples in the, in the Bible, maybe even in the New Testament, where this point is emphasized? How the people just rejected the words of the prophets and just had no regard for it. Any thoughts that come to mind? Yeah, very good. Yeah, they asked for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And God told Samuel, who was very upset, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So there is application for us today. You think about us in America. Do we want to be like everyone else around us? The people wanted to be like the other nations. We, what kind of nation, I see your hand there, brother, what kind of nation are we, according to 1 Peter chapter 2? That's spiritual nation, holy nation, peculiar people. How did the church grow and just overtake Rome to some degree with their influence? It wasn't with, it wasn't with visitor cards. I don't think they had a sign outside their building. <laughs> they didn't even have a building. <laughs> it was the way they lived. And that's a great point, right, where there's application for us. Are we trying to be like everyone else in the world, or at least here in America? Great point. What else, brother? Absolutely. Yeah. Jesus is obviously the biggest one. Yeah. What else, brother? Yeah, that's a great point. The comment was made about Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse really 18 through 29, and how the people were uh, led away by, that, by the false teacher um, and uh, how they seemed to be more interested in what Jezebel, who calls herself in verse 20, a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. The other example that I thought of was Acts chapter 7 where Stephen, as he spoke to the, to the Jewish audience there, he gave them the whole timeline of, of how the Israelites acted. And one thought to keep in mind, and this is interesting, we're going to do a study eventually on the Holy Spirit, but you see the Holy Spirit in Isaiah, don't you? They are rejecting, resisting the Holy Spirit by resisting the words of the prophet. They're resisting the Holy Spirit. And that's what, I, that's what Stephen emphasized in Acts chapter 7. Uh, you stiff-necked, you stiff stubborn people who always kill the prophets. You're, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. So people may not say these exact words, 
But 2 Timothy chapter 2, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, remember Timothy is instructed by Paul as an evangelist to, to preach the word. He's instructed to preach the word uh, in season and out of season. And there are times where God's people do not want to hear the word. He said in verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. So maybe the idea of, you know, give us religion but not the truth of the gospel. It's, it's interesting, and you really have to, as you talk to people more than ever today, you really have to ask them, what do you mean by that? A lot of people say, well, I'm not really religious, but I'm spiritual. Well, what does that mean? And so much of this sounds really good, but we have to ask ourselves, okay, what, what, I wonder what, that, what does that mean? Or I love God. Well, that's great. But what does that actually look like? What does that mean when we drill down and, and really ask ourselves? Because if you ask the Israelites during this time, wouldn't they answer the same way? Well, of course I'm spiritual. I mean, look at what we, we worship every week. So I think the, the call to action for us here is do we see ourselves in these chapters? To the point in verse number 11, he says, Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Just stop. That's enough. And remember that description of God it goes back to chapter 1. The Holy One of Israel. I put in next to that verse, whoa. We're, we're tired. They're tired of hearing about God. And that's how some people can get. Some people will get to that point. Because what does the Word of God do to, what does it do always when people hear it? It's going to do one thing at, at least. What's it going to do? What's it going to do to the hearts when people hear it, God's Word? Convicts, it pricks, Right? In Acts chapter 2, hearts were convicted. About 3,000 souls were saved, but it wasn't just their hearts that were convicted. Everyone else that was there, their hearts were convicted as well. And that's what God's word does, and that's where that anger arose so much with the Pharisees and the scribes, where they just got so angry at Jesus, and all he was doing was teaching them the truth. But that's what the truth will do. And so they said, we don't want to hear anything else about uh, you know, about God. And so watch what happens. Therefore, as a result of this, thus says the Holy One of Israel. Fine, you don't want to hear? Since you have rejected this word and have put your trust in oppression and guile and have relied on them. So remember what we learned. I believe it was back in, let me see if I can remember, back in chapter 28. Go back to chapter 28. In chapter 28, remember what he said in verse number 15? He said in chapter 28 and verse number 15, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death. And maybe that's connecting to Egypt there. And with Sheol, we have made a pact. And, and so now he's saying, okay, listen, if you, if you don't want me, uh, then this is what you're going to get. Verse 13, therefore, this iniquity will be to you like a breach about to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant. Whose collapse? It's like the smashing of a potter's jar so ruthlessly shattered that a shirt will not be found among its pieces to take fire from a hearth or to scoop water from a cistern. And that seems to be the same word that he used to describe Israel in chapter 29 in verse number 1. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, here it is, mark this, highlight it. In repentance and rest you will be saved. Have we heard that before in this book? It's called chapter 1. So think about this. Here's some application. You want application. There's always two words I try to think about when I teach or preach. So what? Well, here's your so what. Repentance and rest, you will be saved. If you really want to be healed and delivered, then that's, what's, that's what we have to do. And repentance comes with a price. Remember, we talked about burning our books out in the parking lot. Doesn't that feel like a long time ago? Kind of missed the truck. No, I don't miss the truck. I'm sorry. I don't miss the truck. Nobody does, right? <laughs> Stephen doesn't miss the truck. 
but in Acts 19, you know, God told his, or Paul told the, or we see Luke writing about the Christians who burned their books. So if you want to be made whole, repentance and rest in God, that's how we can be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you are not willing. So the question for us is, are we willing? Are we willing to repent? Are we willing to to, to truly lay our trust in God? And he said, no, for we will flee on horses. So here's their attitude. You said, no, we'll flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. Yeah, okay, that's what you think, huh? Uh, And we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand will flee at the threat of one man. You will flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on a mountaintop and as a signal on a hill. So if you write in your Bible, turn over to Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1 next to verse number 17. Here's the interesting thing. God is telling them here, this is, this is how you're going to respond. But it's interesting, back in Leviticus chapter 26, I believe verse number 1. Verse number 8, thank you, brother. That's there you go. Verse number 8, if you go back to verse 1, you have these warnings. In verse 2, if you keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes, you see these blessings. And in verse 8, or verse 7, he said, but you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, And your enemies will fall before you by the sword. You see how everything is now reversed? If they did this, then they would have this this deliverance and this this, uh, victory. And so what it would require would be complete reliance upon God. But now when you go back to chapter 30 and look at verse 17, it's now totally the other way. Now they're going to be the ones that are going to flee. And so there is a great point of application of how things will quickly turn. God is pleading and, 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 and begging them to come back, and yet they, they don't do it. And think about the, the way God is being portrayed here, how our Father in heaven has his arms open to us. His arms are always open to us, and he always is willing to accept us back. And that's something I want my son to really understand as he gets older. And that's something that all of us hopefully understand when we fall When we sin, when we fall short, God is still saying, you can come back home. Come back home. In fact, that's what I want you to do. And I think that's so so illustrated in verse 18. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. So don't allow people to say, well, the God of the Old Testament is just some wicked, evil God. It's not true at all. Rather, allow the prophets to help you to understand who God is. Yes, he is a God of justice and righteousness. And his grace is clearly demonstrated with the mercy that he wants to give to everyone. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Listen to this. And therefore, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. So to me, that should be so deeply rooted in our hearts. That our Father in heaven sits high, he looks low, he is patient, he, he desires to have this compassion, and clearly we have seen this uh, by the cross, or, or looking back to the cross. Uh, we, we've seen this patience and compassion of God. Any thoughts or comments with these first 18 verses here? So if you're going to take something out of this, that's one thought that I would really encourage you to take away of... Just the, just the goodness of God. And as you look at verses 18 through 26, and if you look in your workbook, this is actually question number 10 about this picture of the days of the Messiah. Let's just read a few more verses here. In verse 19, it says, O people in Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Although the Lord has given you bread of Privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it. 
whenever you turn to the right or to the left. And you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver and your molten images plated with gold. You will, be, you will scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, be gone. So that's certainly what we need to do with our idols. Then he will give you rain for the seed which you will sow in the ground and bread from the yield of the ground. And it will be rich and plenteous. On that day your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture. Also the oxen and the donkeys which work the ground will eat salted fodder which has been winnowed with shovel and fork. On every lofty mountain and on every high hill there will be streams running with water on the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun and the light of the sun will be seven times brighter like the light of seven days. On the day the Lord binds up the fracture of his people and heals the bruise he has inflicted. So again, this imagery here, I think really, if you look in your workbook on page number 40, in the middle section, it says the future will be different. And he says here in the workbook, again, the prophet points to the future days of the Messiah, that God will be gracious and just. He will be just and punish the generation of Isaiah's day, and yet be gracious and bless another generation in the time of the Messiah. And that day God will hear and answer their cry. Israel will tune their ears to God's word and walk in it rather than push their teachers off in a corner. Rather than reject the word and its teachers, they will reject idolatry. And this will be a time when God will abundantly bless his children. So we have this back and forth, this contrast of dark and lightness or dark and light in, this, in, in the book of Isaiah. And certainly after the captivity, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, uh, idolatry, I believe, was a thing of the past. And it was finally rooted out, and it, and it took that um, for them to, to truly let go. Any thoughts or comments? So think about this last section here, and let's jump over to chapter 31. I think this is a fitting place for us to end. Woe to those who go down to Egypt. So you can see this cord that is being tied into these last few chapters. For help and rely on horses. Proverbs 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. They trusted in horses. Where do we put our trust? We've got to ask ourselves, right? Horses was strength, power. Safety. Where do we where are we putting our trust? It has to be in God. And trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words, but will ar arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. And their horses are flesh and not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out his hand, and he who helps will stumble. And he who is helped will fall. It's a losing endeavor. And all of them will come to an end together. So think about what we see here just about God. God is, God is powerful. He is wise. His promises need to be trusted. He will judge. And he's all-knowing. He's not like men. And time and time again, we see these vivid contrasts about God. For thus says the Lord to me, in verse 4, as the lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out. And he will not be terrified at their voice, nor disturbed at their noise. So will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war on Mount Zion and on its hill. Like flying birds, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Return to him from you who have deeply defected, O sons of Israel. So again, that language there, they, it reminds me of Paul's language, how some shipwreck their faith. They've just gone. They veered off to the wrong or in the wrong direction. So let's think about ourselves here as we wrap this up. We'll have to stop here. Lord willing, we'll go through chapter 32. And we'll, go, we'll begin the next lesson, which I believe will go through chapters 33 through 35. But let's take into consideration our Father in heaven. And let's look at ourselves as we read this. Uh, yes, he was talking to the nation of Israel. But we can take away from this, do we truly 
fear God the way in which we should? Are we truly trusting in God in the way that we should? You know, it's interesting. It kind of feels like things are kind of getting back to normal. And I know everybody's got a mask on except for me. You guys are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, he's got problems. He's been wearing his mask a little too much. But it, like on the weekends, it's packed. And maybe it's just like a Texas thing. Like on the weekends, like all the restaurants and stuff, they're just, they're just, it's like, well, okay, things are getting back to normal. And when things get back to normal, that's often where there's a lot of danger. Because we settle down, we get comfortable, and and we can, if not careful, go right back to where maybe where we were. But what if today was our last day? What if there's no tomorrow? I know preachers say that all the time. But if something we've learned is... That's exactly what the Israelites did. We got all the time we need. And then the destruction came upon them. So are we falling into that same trap? Eat, drink, tomorrow we'll die. No no concern. If we are, we are foolish and we're missing the words of these prophets that are trying to tell us if you are deeply defected turn back to God right now that's what we need to take out of this let's pray thank you father for being gracious to us thank you father for loving us thank you father for sitting high and having compassion help us father to return to you if we are deeply defected help us to repent of our sin And to truly understand that only rest, true rest, satisfaction can be found in you. In Jesus' name, amen.